that's a better one. It's three down here, better one close in about Woodland Pout and two smoking up and clear a zone through there. It's like carp soup here. The fish are enjoying a little bit of sunshine along this margin that we're on the outer bounds bank, which we're allowed to walk around to put a bit of bait in. Um, and spring carp being spring carp play, it's just at the beginning of April. It's been a cold March, you know, it's been a bit pants to be quite honest. But come up to a little syndicate lake that I'm lucky enough to be a member of. It's a good cold water venue at the best of times anyway. Like, um, we just had a scout round first thing in the morning, just as the sun was starting to get a little bit of temperature into it. And uh, they're just down this sunny margin like from the corner all the way up to like behind a little dot island and a little bit beyond as well but there's oodles literally just here where we're filming there's like a real herd of them a herd of them as not nick would say um but quite a lot of them are smaller ones so we're gonna carry on go up another little tree i'm gonna think about my strategy in terms of getting some spots going because i've got a bit of bait with me and they do react positively to bait. We've got cold nights but we've got big winds coming in and where is the far end shallow? Um, they'll probably quite lightly go up there before the weather turns. If I can get some bait in on zones, won't fish tight, like big particles, I won't be going seed or anything like that because I want to be fishing choddies over the top of them. Like this is the perfect choddy opportunity along here at the moment. You've got like weed, it's kind of like anything from that up to that so a, a chod with the stop light about two or three foot up is going to present every time and i'm just going to nip around the other side um, and stick a couple of little medium height choddies across and really light leads you know i think that's the key these fish were just at the arse end of the bank holiday so they've been fished for a little bit that might be a little bit flighty but if i can get singles in on them we'll be fishing and in with a chance of a daytime bite and that will give me a chance also to go and get a bucket of like I've got some peanuts I've got some 12 mil krill I want to bait up and overhang down this side of the island where I've just seen a real puck of fish I think it's a fish called black spot but all along here there's big groups of fish there's like fish bubbling there right now and they're just going up this tree they're flanking on the bottom sunning they're happy as Larry really relaxed and a relaxed carp is a happy carp and a carp that you can stick hook in hopefully. Like cold nights might not be pucker, big winds should stir them up and at the very worst it will hold them down this end which is the slightly deeper end. But um, enough jibber jabbering, I want to go and get the rods out. Spring carp, aware of my presence now I think, so I'm going to have to back out because I need to go and get some rods in. There's fish all the way along this margin. So, let's go and get the gear out of the van. Bubbler. Right, um, just going to go and prime a couple of spots. They do like a bit of bait in there, like I said before, so get some bait in. Uh, the rods have been out for a little while. There's still signs of fish, but I think it's time to get some bait in, start developing some confidence, feeding on a couple of key zones under the overhangs, 
um, and it's building something for tomorrow or even the morning after. Keep the bait going in little and often and hopefully we'll get a chance, so I'm off. little word about what we're priming up with. Over the chods, like, don't really want loads of seed and tiny bits, so I tend to just put in whole boilies, whole nuts, peanuts being my favourite, as long as they're properly prepared, they're as safe as houses. Uh, that was proven in court by Hades, I believe. Um, but just scattering it kind of thing, not going right on one sort of spot, just I'm going to put them all along the edge of this overhang where I just led it to to find the distance. Um, and, and, and just start it off. It's just about building something for tonight or tomorrow morning. We'll be able to nip around, it's only a little lake, go up the tree, have a look, and you can see as soon as they've been on it, the water will colour up because of the fine kind of like clayish sediment that holds the gravel together. It goes into a lovely milky cloud and we'll be able to spot straight away. So I'm gonna go and jump in the edge and uh, scatter some goodness. We were on an absolutely gorgeous little estate lake. Um, the bottom was very soft and silty, but it, it, you can see all these lovely clayish, fine gravel spots where they clean it off the fish in it. It's about six acres. Um, long skinny lake with one bank out of bounds. The near side is the fishing bank. You're allowed to stalk off the end banks. I rarely see anybody do that unless it's down the dam end. Down the dam end, you've probably got the deepest water going down to a maximum of about eight foot. As you come up the lake, it gets progressively shallower and shallower and probably siltier as you go up to the shallows as well. Lots of natural stuffed into it because it's all spring fed and consequently it's good for summer and winter bites. I guess in the summer it suffers from low water because the spring can dry up right up there, but most of the time it's pucker. Um, the fisher crackers, probably three, maybe four if the parrot's up there, 40 pounders in here, which is quite a stock if you add it to the dozen or so beautiful 30 pounders in here. And then you've got a real mishmash of follow-ups kind of thing, ranging from little homebred commons with high backs and that are perfect to beautiful scaly upper 20s and some beautiful commons as well. Um, it's a cracking lake, it's fun to fish, it's safe to fish as well, and what I love loads is it's quiet as well. No pervasive road noise, it's just beautiful at night. Um, really gorgeous clear water venue, very lucky to fish here. Well, as you can hear from the pitter patter on the, the shaky brolly, uh, that weather they promised is definitely coming. It's uh, blowing a hoolie now and again, big gusts, but the temperatures dropped, that ambient temperature's totally gone away. With the departure of the sun, the fish are no longer on that far margin. Um, I've just done a little circuit, couldn't find anything in the edge anywhere. So I'm thinking for the night, dropping them shorter, like sort of halfway, a little scatter of bait over and the plastic hook baits are going to have to go on because of um, the dreaded crawfish. Like, oh, wretched animals. But we can whip them off again first thing in the morning, put proper baits on. And we've got a little weather window come the morning. So I reckon there's always a hope. This is, I nearly said the name of the venue then, but as the, 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 the local syndicate members say, there's always a chance of a bite on here. And I'm quite hopeful. I think they've just moved off the shelves where they were really visible in the sun earlier. 
they're still going to be feeding. They were so active, flanking and fizzing earlier, that they're not going to just stop and go doggo. Um, just going to keep doing circuits in the rain and hopefully see something flop out at some point and give us a clue as to where they are exactly so that we can deposit hook bait right on top of them. Till then, it's just keeping the eyes peeled, isn't it? So, but it's nice to be on the bank. Always nice to be on the bank. Well, the palatial comfort of the lodge here on the fishery has called us in because the deterioration in conditions is somewhere between Noah turning up across the field at any moment and it just flooding out and being repulsive. Um, what can you do? You pick a date, you come to film, it's just the way it is. You roll the dice and hope for the best. We have just in the last hour or two seen a couple of fish show so I've covered one on the left hand side of the island as we stood here in the palace um, plastic hook bait because of the craze went down nice enough I fired a few boilies over it because it's just hard getting my head round fishing single plastics and the left hand rod's gone over one of the baited spots from earlier um, our very friendly fisheries manager is absolutely certain that left hand rod's going to do a bite but yeah we shall wait and see it's actually eased off a tiny little bit now just for this piece of camera but conditions are going to get proper hairy again tomorrow um, but we've set the traps we've rolled the dice and with a bit of luck we'll have a bite in the night uh, it's never bereft of hope is it you know it's april there's fish that are active it just takes one to make a silly mistake and suck in the wrong boilie, and we'll be laughing. The old trolley done the job. Just as that storm front raged through, and as I was trying to get some shot eye, the old left hand rod, which I chucked out over the pre-baited area, just a bit of plastic to avoid the craze. Pulled up tight and round. And we had this lovely common carp, 30 pound, four ounces. She wasn't much of a battler to be honest, but the water's still very cold for the time of year and they can tend to be a little bit lethargic. But a little bit of a tug, a bit of weed bed on the way back. And she rattled back into the net. We just waited for the storm to go through. Just had time to settle down. And, uh, well chuffed with her. Considering the sketchy weather, I was surprised to get a bite to be honest, but beautiful, scale perfect, and just how we like them. Time to go back. Oi, oi! There she goes. First proper full morning. Um, in the night, had a little one, which, uh, considering the conditions, and it, I'm still wet now from yesterday. Uh, we just flopped her back. It was like a lovely, pretty mid-double. One of the young ones that will grow like stink in the lake, but it wasn't worth retaining her over the last few hours of darkness. Um, plan for today is, well, after having the bite in the evening off the baited spot to the left, I'm going to go top that up again, probably rechuck that rod over the top of it, accurately because in the dark and in the wind it was an abomination i think it went in the zone it's a nice flat clearish area that you can see there um got a drop but 
as nothing's happened and it was a dark chuck, it needs redoing. And I've still not fished the overhang canopy. Well, as that bait's gone, I'm pretty sure without a line on it, that bait would have gone because they're very liner wearing this lake. We're just going to nip round basically, slop through the slop, put in probably half the quantity that I put in yesterday over both areas. So rather than a little bucket on both, one little bucket across the two, um, reset the traps ahead of this afternoon's weather, which again is going to be like biblical Noah, slop and mud everywhere type fishing and just see whether we can nick a bite this morning, which I'm confident now. They're active uh, and with the sun peeking out, and the moon setting in about two hours from the looks of it, let's hope that we can make another bite. I've had a little nibble at it. Time to swap over to real baits. Um, it's that perennial problem of, personally, I don't mind fishing plastics over bait, but when there's crayfish about, you can't take the risk, because otherwise you get to morning bite time or nighttime bite time, and it's better to have a plastic on than nothing at all. It's just the simple logic, so I've always felt that you get more bait bites on real, even though I flavour the um, the plastics. Like the bite I had on last night was like a sweetener and a classic old sweet flavour combination of Scopex and um, chocolate malt. Like an old man, you can't odd some things. Um, it's always been a, a good combination, but now I'm just putting a nice krill soaked 16 mil pop up on just to fish over the bait. If there are crays out there, they're going to be in their burrows at least this morning whilst the sun's out. So we'll be safe to go and I'll swap back over to the plastics for the night, but definitely, definitely given the choice fish real baits all the time but you just can't odds it on a lake with the with the dreaded crawls in horrid wretched things like you've got to have something on your hook and if they're feeding on bait and sucking and blowing at bits on the bottom something's better than nothing it's always something that's going to be better than nothing so i'm gonna whip this one out to that left hand area I just scattered a load of uh, peanut and 12 millers. Um, try and find a lighter. And then the other one is going back where they showed yesterday morning in the bright sun. Because bright morning again. They're going to be loving it. Spring carp and sunshine. It's like iron filings and a magnet in it. So that'll do. Weight down the margin. Chuck it up the lake to that flat, silty-ish, cleaned-off area where I just scattered all the bait and uh, wander back down the margin of the rod in a minute.
Well, after a fairly productive night and a nice common, that 30 pounder was a banger. I had it kind of early, so she was never going to go in the sack to darken off for the early morning shoot. Um, had another little one. Um, I've been round this morning, rebaited both of the main spots and on the reed line opposite where the fish showed quite a lot yesterday and where we've seen little subtle shows this morning, um, just scattered really loosely, throwing the bait kind of like sideways so it'd do a line out of the right range. Um, set the traps and we're just waiting for something to happen. We're waiting on another big front to come rolling in and it's going to be a real nasty one. There's 60 mile an hour gusts coming across the field from behind us. So it may be a, a duck and cover this afternoon. That's always a safe option. Um, really, it's just waiting for the next bite now. It, really glad to have had a bite under my belt. Like anyone out doing a video, it's horrific, the thought of failing. And we've all done it when we've been out doing them, but really glad to have had a bite seen fish in the area again and it does look really promising like uh, at the very worst we've got to have a chance of a bite this evening again because this lake's scintillatingly good for an evening bite it is lovely um if not it will be the same cycle again this evening as we did last night swap over to the plastic hook baits for the night and then up early rebate if necessary if we've had action and put the real ones on because there's no doubt that the real pretty much will get a bite when the plastic's failing as long as you've got fish in the zone like and as long as you're presented obviously so yeah it's all looking really hopeful and just hope we don't get as filthy wet as we did yesterday afternoon when the weather comes in it's lovely Some people get a bit confused about bait application over the chods. Well, later on in the spring, when the water temperatures are up and you may not want to fish with just the singles, oh, then you really want a little bit of bait out there just to get them browsing about. But you're thinking about fish that are moving from one hook bait or one freebie to another, and then coming across a really nicely presented little low pop-up in amongst like sort of low weed, uh, seal on top of the leaves that like you find around the edges of a lot of lakes. It is just an all-purpose kind of presentation that works everywhere but bait wise just simple boilies. If you want to slice them so they hang up in the weed or lay on top of stuff because they're lighter, they haven't got the round faces that tend to roll and go down through any of the, 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 the weed certainly, then that's a great method to get out there. Dotting it out there with a tiny spawn just around the area is just nice. It's minimal disturbance, but what's king is the stick and the catapult, in my opinion. Um, if you want to get bigger particles like slow sinking peanuts out there, then you're probably tied to having to use that unless you're fishing right in the edge. Or like here, you can go around the other side and throw them in by hand. But really, it's about keeping it kind of like not a concentration, but just enough bait to get a bite. Like whether you choose boilies or a combination with the nuts, it doesn't really matter. It's getting those fish moving from one bait to another, browsing about, and that way they're more likely to pick the hook bait up. And that ends up with a wet net and a happy big smile on your face. In typical fashion, you go for a little walk to check the spots and the fish picks up your hook bait literally whilst you're over there. It's a bit weeded at the moment but it's only light fluff out there, he says. Blowing a hoolie though. Let's see whether we can tease this one in. Come on, kick out. Feels like it's on old line, I'll give it a pull. Ah, oh, there she comes. There was one better one over there. 
It was a little bit further off the bank, probably about where the hook bait was. So with a bit of luck, she ain't gonna be a butt mouth spinner. Oh, oh, head shaken off. Ooh! We reset her. Oh well. Tied a rig, the one that we caught my unhooking mat with as it blew down the lake. Um, so we know she's sharp. No, she's beautiful. And I'm just going slightly bigger hook because I can get away with a slightly bigger hook bait that way. And literally, she's going straight back out. Just got to walk her out to, or wrap her up to the mark knot and then give her a fling. Well, a lot of fishing in general, and cod fishing in particular, is about being reactive, which is a bit like uh, urinating into a strong breeze, and a very strong breeze that we've had today. Uh, seeing anything except for that bird just picking up my right hand hook bait has been a little bit difficult, um, but we found some fish smoking up down on the dam wall. Um, so. I've been feeding maggots in there since we got it yesterday morning. Like I've put in a couple of hits of them, kind of a couple of pints at a time, and they're ripping it up over the spot. The spot's visibly clearer. So I'm gonna just go and lower in a maggot bag and see whether we can nick a quick bite just until the evening bite time comes along. So it keep us out of biz out of uh, mischief for an hour or two. Maybe sooner than that if they're there feeding as heavily as uh, they look they are. And uh, We'll reset the, the main traps later on and hopefully get an evening bite because it is good for an evening bite this late. <laughs> These maggots are lively, aren't they? <laughs> None of them are moving. Why aren't any of them moving? Find one that's alive. That'll do the job. Rods in, I went up the tree, um, lovely convenient tree with the telegraph pole posts embedded into it and when I was up there straight away two fish have come in and fed right in the vicinity of the little bag. Um, I was literally thinking, looking back at the rod tip, waiting for it just to hurl round. Uh, since then they've been a little bit cautious as they come in and have a look at the area. It's making me think that the leader might be lying funny over a twig or something, but I've just put a bank stick in with a buzzer um, and we're going to give it like sort of 
half hour, hour. It is quite close to my left hand rod spot from over in the main swim, so don't want to disturb it too much. But if we can nick a bonus by, oh, that would be absolutely lovely. So um, just going to give it half hour, wait and see. Otherwise, it's, it'll be time to go and um, change over to the plastic, have the rod back on the left hand spot. Back one rod onto the rod I've been baiting, and I've just seen one stick its head out a oh, um, bit further down, but still up this end of the lake. It's looking promising. And I'm so ably informed by my compatriot that um, mega moon phase and below 990 air pressure, so how can a noddy fail? <laughs> Always an interesting interlude. Just stood here talking and right hand rod fishing across to the far margin. I just scattered a few nuts and bits really loosely. Gently pulled up tight and I genuinely thought that it was a, a coot that was loitering around by it. But then it, it just another bleep pulled up again and uh, I don't want to call it a little one because they're quite lethargic at this time of year, but it, it's rolling about on the top. And it, it doesn't look like a monster. One of the fish that spawned in here naturally. Stinky little thing. Bless it. <laughs> Pretty little common, similarish to the one I had last night. It's one that's bred in here spawned on and come through in the last four years, so one cannot grumble, it's a bite, but it'd be nice to have on that channel. So let's sort her out, make sure she's safe. Nineteen and a half. Pretty little common carp. Go. Bit of excitement for the evening. Pretty little nineteen. Chodded out over that far bank. Top end where the left hand rod was fishing has gone a bit quiet and I'm not surprised that we've picked out one of the smaller ones. They tend to be the stragglers, so a little change for this evening I think and tonight, but for now 
Thank you. It's lovely. Oh, I like that. Pretty little common, and I'm pretty sure that's one of the ones that I've bred in here before. So, happy days. Well, that lovely little 19 and a half pounder seems like the perfect time to have a little swap around. Um, looking at the clarity of the water up the top end, it's clear that the fish have become aware that they're being angled for. I've seen it on here loads of times. Once they've clocked that they're being fished for, they move from one, one area up to the middle or even up to the top end. So I'm gonna have a little swap around, put plastics on, um, stick them out for the night basically. The area that I've been baiting since we got here over on the far bank nearish the island, it's not quite behind. I'm gonna definitely put one on there tonight. They'd have eaten it. I've been watching the birds, the birds have gone across it, not dived, so it's gone. Um, I'll put a plastic fantastic over there. Probably launch one back up onto the baited spot up to the left where I had the 30 pounder from last night, just because there's a really good possibility that, that they might sneak back, you never know. But I'm hedging my bait bets really with that right hand rod over there. Um, the bait would have gone and that should mean that they're comfortable and confident and it should be good for a bite. But we'll give it a go and see. Getting the buoyancy of your hook bait is absolutely essential. The chod needs to be held up right. So you need a good quality buoyant hook bait and the buoyancy needs to be correct. Not so much that it will hold the leader up or if you're using it naked, you can balance it and control how quickly slow it, it sinks but the easy test is literally to lower your rig vertically off your rod tip into the margin and your hook bait should pop up to either the surface or the top stop. If it doesn't pop up, it's a no-no. You need a more buoyant hook bait and that in itself will give you better presentation, better hook holds and just better angling efficiency. How wrong with that? It's been a lovely day. We've had every weather known to man come through. At the moment, we're in a, a little bit of a lull, but as you could probably see behind, it's, it's slate gray and looking quite ominous. There is a bit of a blow forecast for tonight again, but we survived today. We'll survive another few hours of it yet. Um, plastic cook baits are out, baited. Everything's ready, really probably put a little bit too much in for the evening bite but there was bubblers over on the unfished baited spot over yonder right hand side um, by the the nice foliage so you never know could get a quick bite it's not like i hauled loads of bait in just like probably a third of a bucket of peanuts and 12 mil krill 
they can smash that in no time at all. So I'm quite optimistic for tonight. Air pressure's low, moon phase is good. What can go wrong? Almost everything, but that's fishing. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, Bibby heater on, dry me foot out, life will be good again. Jesus, could it actually be a mirror? Yeah, the scaly one. Ooh. I wonder if anyone's actually going to catch a mirror carp. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Behave yourself. <laughs> She's a surprise. She's pretty. Oh, thank you, dear. Well, a much lovelier morning again. Well, all the mornings have been lovely. Today's particularly lovely. Had a bite in the early hours. Um, pretty. Pretty little 21 pound, 21 and a half pound common, which is just floating about in our little retainer there. Um, and just had an opportunist scaly mirror at long last. So I was wondering why I hadn't caught any mirrors yet, because there tend to be slightly more mirrors than commons. And I was pondering it last night thinking, was it the sweet baits? Wondering what it was, because I've been, been there before, a uh, long time ago on an old boyer's water called Cumbrook West, when there were some beautiful mirrors in there, and all I could catch was commons, and it was sweet baits versus savoury baits. So I was going through this whole dilemma last night of thinking, maybe it's the sweet peanuts, and should I set a trap today, just the boily, and see whether that could buy one. And um, the opportunist rod, cheeky opportunist rod was just over Boily and it was a real hook bait that survived the night next to the island over quite a bit of bait as well. I probably catapulted out 150 Boilies around it last night right on dusk um, and that's gone and we've got a scaly banger. Ooh, he's lovely he is as well. I've, we'll get that one out in a minute. So yeah, like a couple of bites again last night. Um, Having a syndicate member up the other end has probably done us a little favour. Well, he's not just the other side of the island because the fish would shift from one side to the other under pressure otherwise. If there's no one up that end they know and they'll go up there. So, um, happy days. Let's sort the fish out, get a little bit moist again.
as you can probably tell, as it's not a mirror, this is the one I had in the night, early hours. Little bit of a tug in the pool. That left on rod's a bit funny. They do tend to pick up a little bit of a weed on the bite, on the chods with the, the long drops and slack lines. They get a little bit of a head start on you, but you need to do it for presentation. And uh, she was nailed properly. I thought I was going to have to get the forceps on her, but pretty little common. Absolutely mint. Young fish, bit of growing to do, but beautiful colour. Well, I'm happy with her. Quite a pale one for the lake, considering the clarity of water. But it is she lovely. <laughs> Everything intact and as it should be. Good hook hold on her. That child wasn't going to give let go at any point. And uh, last morning, but if this is our last fish, we'll walk away a very happy Lulu. Very lovely. There's always a lot of debate about rigs, what's good, what's not, what works, what doesn't. But a perennial favourite for debate is this, the good old choddy. It's been around now since the 90s. It's evolved ever so slightly with the introduction of new hook link materials with the, the super stiff hook links, like the same as it worked on the hinge stiff rigs. Um, but essentially, the application is still the same of having a very short pop-up section, free flowing up on your main line or on a, a leader so that it can settle over almost anything. And that in essence, in one single statement, is exactly what makes it one of the greatest rigs that's ever been invented, is its capacity, its simple ability to just present a hook bait in virtually any situation as long as you know how to tweak it and adjust it so that it will sit on top of whatever you need it to sit on. It's not subtle in that context by any means, but that's what makes it such a good singles hook bait. Like, you know, in this time of the year, the spring, but also when the weed's up or in the winter when you want a bright one in front of the carp so that it's really visible because their eyesight's been knocked back because of the cold temperatures. It's just a four by four go anywhere presentation. We've been using it really since the 90s. Uh, I'm unnecessarily going to name drop Tell, but it was him that brought the concept back after he'd fished with Frank Warwick on the manor in Oxford. And it kind of like evolved from there with the application of the high memory mono hook link material and a little curve just to add that little bit of a twist in it. And it's ever such a simple rig to apply. You know, it's just as simple as having it on some kind of a ring swivel. Um, you can do without the bead, holding it away from the lead, but really that just saves your hook point from being bashed about. And some people think by shortening it and having it right up by the top bead, 
you're probably improving the hooking mechanics of it as well. That's a debate. I'm not even going to get into that one now, but really, in essence, it's keeping it away from the lead because if you have it right the way down, it can easily just catch up on the lead, smack it on the cast. Just a couple of inches separation with a tight fitting, like sort of a bead like this one, a, a tight fitting oval, or just by using a rubber bead with the leader or main line pulled through it, it makes it simple. Um, for presentation purposes, balancing it with the right hook bait is really important, you know. If you're fishing naked, you'll probably need to apply a little bit of rig putty onto the swivel to make sure that it sinks slowly under the weight of the fluorocarbon and the swivel itself. But most of the time, using a lead core, a lead free leader, for most hook baits, is enough to get it to settle slowly over the top. There's a few really simple key tips, like that as a, a long term chod user, you just pick up and you learn and you know without even thinking about it. And probably the two most important to my mind, once you've got the critical elements of the, the hook bait and the rig tied correctly in place, is firstly, how you settle the line, particularly in weed. This is really absolutely critical. As soon as you tighten the line to sink it, you're risking pulling that leader material down into the weed and essentially burying your hook link down in the weed as well when you're fishing in that scenario. Just be as gentle as you can. You wanna allow like that mono to, to tease down through the surface film and settle with as minimal tension as possible. Sometimes it's awkward on a crosswind, but you just do it as little as you can to maintain good presentation. And the other one is another element of chod usage, which people get a little bit confused by, is the slack lines and the light bobbins. Most of the time, and I say that because there are exceptions, say if you're fishing a flat shallow air plat area, a plateau kind of thing in shallow water, you can fish a tight line, but most of the time you want your main line and essentially your leader to, to settle nice and subtly. Uh, again, exactly the same logic behind it as pulling the line down through the walk column. You don't want it to get pulled down under tension. Um, that's really it. Apart from that, if you get those elements dead right, it's so simple. Bite indication on the light bobbins generally ends up as a positive lift straight up to the top. It may not pull out the clip and rattle off unless you're zipped up in your bivvy and take your time to get to the rod. Kind of thing. More often than not, it's just a positive lift. And that's because of water pressure and the resistance of the line as it pulls tight is far more than the weight of the light bobbin. So you don't really need to worry about that. Sometimes if you're fishing an open lake with a big undertow, it can be a little bit of a problem. But in that scenario, something like fluorocarbon will fix the issue. It fixes it down onto the bottom and stops the line bellying round and tightening up. And it's very much a bonus in terms of the overall approach with the chod rig. Um, sometimes range precludes the capacity to do that. And then you just fish in the best way you possibly can confident in most circumstances that the hook bait should remain clear. Tying the choddy end section is really very simple. You just start off by stripping off probably four or five inches of recoil. If you choose the diameter against the size of your hook, it will save you a bit of grief because with a knotless knot, you're trying to get that material through the eye of the hook three times once you've created the D. And you've got to bear that in mind. If you go 30 pound on a smaller size hook, you'll probably end up having a real problem trying to get the D back through at the end of it. Even if you pull the, the hook link tight to one side of the eye, it can be a little bit of a pain. If you're down to a size six, use the 25 pound version. If you're going down even smaller on your chod hook size, it's probably worth considering going down to the 20. It's still stiff enough to retain the curve that you're looking for and it will do the job. The outturned eye essentially enables the hook to sit at a very tidy angle. There's some anglers that like to curve the hook right the way around and great anglers, anglers that catch a lot of fish. But I prefer the 
gentle curve that you can create. So simple seven or eight turn knot less knot. Create the D just by tucking the end of the hook link back through the eye once you've put hook ring swivel on and then you'll be left with probably three inches of hook link. You can either tie that direct onto a ring swivel or like I do here just a simple single overhand loop knot. You know if you're tying it straight onto swivel just a two turn blood will do the job and you, and you can just blob the end of it. These materials are really underrated so even if you're knocking 20% off the linear strength by tying what is essentially not a high efficiency knot, you'll find that it's really very, very strong still. If you tie a little loop knot, you can use one of our nice tidy crook beads just to attach it onto a quick change swivel. If you prefer the idea of having no hinge there, because I tend to use this rig for convenience, but some people prefer there to be a retention of stiffness right the way through to the, the ring swivel, um, then you've at least got a really tidy place to mould a bit of rig putty on if your pop-up's overly buoyant. In terms of the leader, you've got a couple of options really. You can use a lead core for very, for the spring fishing scenario, it's ideal, and with really buoyant cork board hook baits. But for most angling now, I prefer to use a, a long lead free, like our subfleck, simply because of the versatility offers, especially in the, when the weed gets up. If you think of all that weight that's going to be behind your hook bait on a long flowing chart, a lead core can quite easily belly the, the leader down and almost drag the hook bait down into the weed. Whereas with the lead free, you get a beautiful balance between the right buoyancy hook bait, the right size swivel, and that little bit weight of the leader material and the ring swivel, and a gentle settling technique, and it tends to stay in position without bellying down. So that's really useful in high weed with a really long leader when you've got the stop right up the top and you've not got the weight behind it. Like I said before, I've got my lead attached with a C-clip. Uh, you can either use a heavy ring spliced onto the end of your leader or I tend to use just a simple split ring because that way I can permanently attach a heavier lead when I want to really whack it out a long way. Long splices are important on the lead free material in particular but I, I tend to err on the side of caution and use long splices with any material simply for the extra security that longer friction surface creates and you'll never have a problem if you do it carefully and concertina as much of the hollow braid onto the splicing needle as you possibly can. Um, and the length of the leader, well I tend to use my leaders for everything. I just slide the, the, the lead cord safety top bead down to just above the lead when I'm fishing a conventional D-rig or just push it straight up the leader when I want to stick a choddy out there. Um, again, at the top of the leader, nice long spliced loop and I just attach either my braided main line or my OGX on with a, a loop knot. Um, I am a bit of a fanny I, on a braided line. I like to tie what's called a bimini twist because it's a nigh on 100% braid knot. But on all monos and, um, and probably fluorocarbon as well, a more conventional figure of eight loop will do the job. I would just say, if you practice, try and get used to tie, putting an extra twist into your figure of eight, because there's a, a, a definite advantage in terms of strength. You can tie a normal Palomar onto the top, a Greener, just be careful when you're pulling it down tight, just to maintain the ultimate knot strength. But in essence, it's a very simple rig to, to tie. It's a very simple rig to fish in that it's a singles and scattering specialist rig. You wouldn't necessarily chuck this over a load of seed in a tight area. For reactive fishing, whatever time of the year it is, when you want to get a rig in place and know that it's presented, there really is no equal to it. You can chuck it out, get a semi-reasonable drop, and as long as you've allowed, say, 50% further than you think the depth of the weed is from the lead up to your top stop, 
it's almost a guaranteed presentation. It's lovely and it's a hugely effective presentation. Definitely a better one, mate. Well, that one. Rechuck the rod down on just a freestyle cast and it landed absolutely immensely on the bushes towards the back side of the island hence I had to give her a little bit then just to make sure that she was clear because although the island looks treacherous it's pretty safe even if you get fish kite round but this one is a different animal I think from what we've had up till now In fact, I'm quite scared as to what it could be. To use a Wilsonism. So, you might have a bit of a nervous silence for a while here. Lovely face on that. Come on. Ooh, I'm not going to force the issue. There you go. Oh, I'll take that. She is beautiful. Lovely jubbly. lovely mouth and the colour of her. It's just everything I love in a mirror carp, that one is. Absolutely wonderful. And the icing on a really fun trip. Been lovely. We've had every weather known to man. And we're finishing with a bit of a hailstorm, drenched sleeping bag and everything, and an absolute cracker. You literally cannot say better than that. Mm -hmm.